I've wanted to marry you ever since I was little. But I won't. I can't. Hadn't you better tell me about it? No. But I do love you. Well, part of me does. It's like there were two me's. One of them says, yes, yes, quick, don't let me get away. And the other? I won't tell you. But what it wants, what does, or what'll happen to it, I don't know myself. All I know is I hate it. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. <laughs> Welcome to Ticklish Business. I'm Samantha Ellis, joined by our new co-host, Emily Edwards. So excited to talk this week about Miriam Hopkins. This week, we're without our fearless leader, Kristen, unfortunately, as she's busy covering Cannes Film Festival. But we have a fabulous guest. Alan R. Ellenberger is an incredibly prolific author in the classic film genre, and has written books devoted to the lives and works of stars such as Rudolph Valentino, Margaret O'Brien, and perhaps most notably, Miriam Hopkins and his definitive biography, Miriam Hopkins, Life and Films of a Hollywood Rebel. Before we talk to Alan about Miriam, we'd like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, you should. We do additional bonus pods, including doubled features, looking at remakes, and based on a true podcast looking at biopics and true crime. We just wrapped up our old Hollywood March Madness bracket, and we have plenty more content on the way. We also give out regular care packages of movies and gifts and let you guest on an episode. Patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And don't forget to order Kristen's book. But have you read the book, 52 Literary Gems That Inspired Our Favorite Movies? And our new Redbubble store has some fabulous art by myself and Terrence Hilt. So that should be so great to check out. You've got Makoko mugs and all kinds of good stuff. We are this week talking all about Miriam Hopkins, specifically in one of my favorite films of hers, The Story of Temple Drake from 1933. Alan, how are you? Let's just get this started. How did you start with your love of Miriam? What made you want to write about her? She's really not a star that people gravitate towards these days, which is so unfortunate because she was just as big of a star as the Betty Davises and the Joan Crawfords. I've always been a big fan of Betty Davis. So, of course, she made two films with Betty Davis. And I always thought that the characters she played in both were very, I just was drawn to them. They were so interesting. And I thought she was interesting. And I had read a little bit about her and I had heard about how difficult she could be on the set, how her and Betty Davis had this big feud. And I looked around and there was no biography on her, which I thought was odd because there's usually some kind of a biography on most everybody, at least as big as she is. That's what urged me to start to research and writing the book. I definitely relate to that. Right now I'm doing all my Louise Reiner research because I was in the same boat as you. There's just not a book on some of these women, which is so crazy in this day. Yeah, everybody deserves a book, I think. Absolutely. Anyone who made a film in Hollywood. I'm such a sucker for the 1930s. I love all 1930s films. And Miriam is just such a great pillar of what a 1930s actress should be. It's so great that you wrote this book, Story of Temple Drake. When was the first time you saw that film? And Emily, I'd also like to go to you afterwards. There was a bootleg copy out there. There wasn't the clear restored version that we have now. So it's 10 or more years. No, it had to be because they restored it in 2011 or something. But anyway, it was years ago. And I think I bought a copy of the bootleg off of eBay. This was during my research. So that's when I first saw it back then. But it was a really bad copy and edited poorly. That's horrible. We have to hand it to the Criterion for restoring and releasing this. The Criterion edition, which I have on Blu-ray, I got it like, as soon as it came out. I had never seen this movie, but I bought it because I knew that it would be something really great. Emily, what about you? When did you first see this one? I have to admit, you know, Samantha, that I don't have the same sort of pedigree in classic movies that you and Kristen do. So this was actually my first time seeing it. My exposure to 1930s films 
were the fantastical musicals and things like that. So I was really fascinated to see this portrayal of a Faulkner novel, which I read quite a bit of Faulkner, both for my separate podcast and also as a literature major. But this story had happened to escape me. So when I was watching this and seeing just the bits of Faulkner that make it into the film rather than the full darkness of Faulkner's Yachnal Patafa County, I was just so fascinated by how well she straddled the line of Faulkner's darkness for his perspective on the 1920s and 30s and what was acceptable for Hollywood at the time, which which was pre-code, as I know we're going to get into today. It was really, really interesting to see just how delicately she played with the femininity and the morality and the expectations of a Southern woman, which she was through and through, which I which I hadn't realized until I read Mr. Ellenberger's book. Yeah, I feel like she taps into that so well. This almost reminds me, I don't know if, if you two would have seen this, but this reminds me of Mary Pickford's Coquette a little bit in a weird way. Almost like drawn out, especially her character, just the way that she acts and like her place in this town's society. But for those who don't know, the story of Temple Drake is about as we may know, Temple Drake, played by Miriam Hopkins. She's a very, how would we describe her? She is flippant in the way that she deals with men. She thinks that she can just treat men however she wants. And some characters definitely don't appreciate her for that, (laughs) as you can see through the movie. That was one of the things when I watched this again that I really took note of, how many people just hated her for the way that she didn't follow through on her dates. This is the best way to put it. So that's how she treats men in the beginning. We see that she's going out on a sort of date. She's going out drinking with this guy, Roddy. They get into a car accident on the side of the road, pretty near where their destination was going to be, (laughs) which is this very shady hole-in-the-wall house run by these truck drivers and bootleggers. We meet some pretty shady characters and some pretty horrible things end up happening to Temple. And it becomes this very drawn out web with the law because her ex is a lawyer and ends up mixing in with these criminals. It becomes very interesting. This is such a gem of the 1930s. It's great, Emily, that you pointed out that, and Alan, that you pointed out Not too many people have even seen this film. I think with the restoration, hopefully more people are putting their eyes on it. It's not a movie that people talk about or gravitate towards. It's really interesting. If you pick this out and analyze it compared to the rest of pre-code cinema, this goes so many more darker places than a regular pre-code watcher wouldn't even expect it to go. Mr. Ellenberger, I was wondering, she struggled quite a long time to be taken as a dramatic, serious actress. Do you know how she felt about approaching this particular film? Did she connect it to it as being a native Georgian or as a place to really stretch her skills? Because it's a very dark movie. I don't know whether she attracted to it as being a Southern part so much, but I know that it was one of those parts she felt had meat to it that she could actually do something because a lot of the parts Paramount was giving her were just not very fluffy blonde they, they had, roles. Yeah. Yeah, this kind of thing. Temple Drake was something that was something that she could actually do something with. She liked it very much. In fact, it was one of her most favorite movies that she did. In fact, it was her favorite movie oh. afterwards. She appreciated Faulkner. She she read, like you said, she was a big reader and so she had read the book. It was just something that she wanted to do and that she felt that she could do a good job, which I think she did. And so did the critics. This is one of those movies. There are so many heavy hitting women of this era, but it's very difficult for me to understand anyone else playing this part. This is such a Miriam role. And it's so interesting to say that because you also have these, as you said, very lighthearted movies that she made around the same time. Like you've got Woman Chases Man and all of those fluffy kind of roles with Joel McRae and Ray Milland that they like to throw her into. But this is so out of her element. It's really out of anybody's element. 
There are so many movies that would go on to deal with sexual assault, but this is, I hate to say, I may be very wrong, it seems one of the first and definitely one of the first to deal with it in such an extended way. I agree. There had been other films that touched on it, but this was the first time it went this far. Although I never read the book, I'm pretty sure it went a lot farther in the book because I think the code at the time kept them from doing too much. So they handled the scene very carefully. And it was something that for back then was probably still very striking and very scandalous. Poking at it through the lens of an incredibly modern and also Yankee person, I could see just how thoroughly in this film, especially, and I know Faulkner touches on this quite a bit, of just how thoroughly male patriarchal roles are in almost inflicted on her during this entire film. She's expected to say yes to a marriage proposal from a gentleman who she is not seeing exclusively and the entire town knows. And even her grandfather, who I believe is her father in the book, says she ought to be reined in by a man as wonderful and noble and selfless as Mr. Benbow, the attorney who represents all of the people who aren't of quality people. It's just really fascinating how every single man in the movie is trying to inflict his agency on this woman, and she holds up to all of them in every single step or plot beat of the movie. Even when she's struggling, she doesn't seem to really bend to their wills. She's making her own decisions based on what is best for her and for the society she lives in. And she just is so steely and wonderful when she's playing this role. That is such a good point. And the other thing too, that I was really glad to see, and it had been such a long time since I'd seen this movie, essentially since it had come out on Criterion. What I really took notice of when I saw it this last time was how many supporting characters are willing to help her as much as they can, even though they're in a very dangerous and abusive situation mm-hmm. with this male patriarchy? <laughs> like Tommy, I think especially, his character is so interesting. The fact that he is her protector through a good amount of the film. I really felt for him. Spoiler alert to a 1933 movie when he is shot. <laughs> He's very much misunderstood in the film. Trigger which was his name in the film. He was just evil, just an evil person. And Temple, like you said, she was a tease to the people of the town. And I'm sure they thought she did more than what she actually did. In reality, she was probably still a virgin. I would probably go that far to say that. But she liked men and she liked to tease them and get the reaction out of them, I think. So whenever Ben Bao kept going after her to marry him, she knows that he's probably too good for her, even though she's probably not the person that the town thinks she is. But she knows that's her reputation. And he's a lawyer and she doesn't want to tarnish his reputation, too. It's so interesting when she refutes his second marriage proposal, she explained it by saying that she has an evil streak, which is such a really interesting way for her to position going after her own desires, being a little flighty, not living up to the seriousness that dating and matrimony holds in the society that you live in. She positions it as being evil, which is such an alarming way to hear just wanting to be a girl in the town. But in 1933, obviously that's 90 years ago. It's an entirely different role in society that she thinks she's filling. Your heart almost breaks for her because she could just keep on keeping on if other people didn't meddle in her desires and her plans for herself. And we see all of these other characters' reactions of her and her behavior. And I feel like that really tells us how everyone perceives her and how her behavior is supposed to be perceived. Just like Tommy says throughout the whole movie, if everyone just lets her alone, she will live her best life. As you mentioned, Alan. Jack LaRue's character Trigger is just the personification of evil. Their interactions are so interesting and so powerful, especially you see the scene after the assault and she's in his car and they're just driving. You see her face. You can see that she's just seen and gone through so much. That is all Miriam Popkins, just such a powerful performance. 
But it's so interesting at the same time, looking at Jack LaRue in this film, I couldn't help but think that, that this is such a, usually in the early 1930s, this would have been such a Humphrey Bogart role. And can you imagine if Humphrey Bogart had played this before he was really huge? Definitely would have marked his entire career if he had played a character capable of things like that. I thought Jack LaRue did a good job. Just looking at him, he looks like a gangster. But they originally wanted George Raft for the role, but he didn't want to do it. He fought them tooth and nail. He said that if he did this role, his career would be ruined. But he said if Adolf Zucker put $2 million in his bank account, then he would do it. But he said otherwise, he goes, I'm not going to go in there and play a gangster who rapes a girl and kills a mentally challenged boy. What would people think? He thought it would ruin his career. But Jack LaRue actually thought it would improve his career because he was just doing regular roles and things like that. And he thought that this role would actually make him a star almost. But actually... It had no effect at all. It didn't hurt his career and it didn't help his career. So he just went back to playing the same old roles that he had before. George Rapp, they told him he was going to do it. They had already started filming. He didn't show up at the first day of filming. So that's when they replaced him with Jack LaRue, but he was put on suspension. He had to wait a while before he got a next film. We know how notorious George Raft is for turning down crazy big and crazy interesting parts. This might be the one role he should have turned down. (laughs) It's a brutal, brutal portrayal of any human being. But sometimes I feel like cutting characters as just evil, it's the easiest way to deal with it. Because if you had given him a backstory and him family and him wants and desires, aside from just the desires that he acts on, it would have been poison for anybody's career. Whereas if you just say, this is a caricature, of just an evil person acting on another human being. It makes it slightly more palatable. And I'm not sure, I'm not as convinced that it would have necessarily completely ruined another person's career because it doesn't really give him anything outside of just actions to take, if that makes sense. If you look at it as a caricature of a gangster that no one could be hypothetically this evil, hopefully, from that angle, I could definitely see another bigger actor taking it. But as you mentioned, Jack LaRue, I think he's perfect for it. He's spot on. He's almost like if Peter Lorre and Humphrey Bogart had a love child, because he's got that element of creepiness to him. I mean, me personally, I had never seen him in a film before this. That helped. If the good old jolly Humphrey Bogart that I have seen in a hundred movies was in a movie like this, or George Raff that I had seen a dozen movies before this, If I had seen that, it would have taken away that element of this is a stranger and I don't know what he's going to do next. There was another reason he didn't want to take it. The first was, of course, he thought it would ruin his career. But the second one was that he hated Miriam Hopkins. They had did a film a year before Dancers in the Dark with Jack Oakey. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. George Raft was in it. They just didn't get along. They would argue about the role she would criticize his acting, which he didn't like. And one day they were arguing about something. And he said, I'm going to punch you in the nose. So she turned around and went to walk away. And he grabbed her and pinched her behind. And that infuriated her. And she turned around and she went to take a swing at him with her fist. And Jack Oakey grabbed her around the waist and held her back. George Raff just walked away and laughed. They didn't like each other. But there are a lot of factors that Miriam didn't like for one reason or another. Want more ticklish business? Join us over on Patreon alongside patrons Melanie, McF, Jacob Haller, David Floyd, Danny, Christine Meyer, Andrew Hopp, Amy Hart, and Allie Moore. Patrons listen to episodes 48 hours early, receive regular guests, and can even guest on an episode of their choice. Patreon also helps us create content like our TCM Classic Film Festival audio episodes and series like Six Weeks with a Thin Man, Being Elvis, Based on a True Podcast, and Doubled Features. It's all on patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And don't forget to get your favorite ticklish biz moments immortalized on merch at a Redbubble shop at redbubble.com slash people slash ticklishbiz. Redbubble is the home for our Gene and Judy Makoko mugs, as well as our May the 4th Welcome to the Loy Side art crafted by artist Terrence Hills. We thank you for your support. Now back to the show. When you say that, that reminds me a lot. We talk so much about Veronica Lake on the show and her relationships with her leading men. What do you think 
it was about Miriam or about these men that they didn't get along with her or vice versa. Was it a similar situation to Veronica in the sense that she just wanted to be her own independent actress and these men were just getting in her hair? Were the Um, circumstances a little different depending on the relationship? I guess it would depend on the relationship, but Miriam had a habit of, when she came on a project, she wanted a good script. And if she didn't think it was a good script, she would sit down and she would rewrite parts of it. That would tick people off. And like she did with George Giraffe, she would criticize the other person's performance if she didn't think it was quality with what hers were. She meant well. And if she would have been a man, it wouldn't have meant such a big deal. Because she was a woman, she was just supposed to take the roles that she was given and do them. And that was it. But she thought that she'd never get anywhere. It was her opinion that she had to improve them in order to to be the same quality that she felt that she she had to do. These were just some of the things. And that's mainly what ticked people off about her was that she just came in and took over. Even the directors would get upset with her. And one time a director said, Mary, why don't you just direct this picture? And she probably would have if they had a letter. I would have loved to see that. She would have been a fantastic director. As we all know, film is such a collaborative medium, and it just seems like she wanted the best out of her team that she Mm -hmm. could get. And unfortunately, maybe sometimes she didn't go about it the right way, but it sounds like she was well-intentioned. Well, as Ben, you're right. She didn't go about it the right way. There were probably better ways that she could have done it. She would have been a good producer anyway. Then she could have had control of the whole thing. And I think that was a dream of hers, but of course, it's not going to happen. Just because of the age. How did Temple Drake affect her career? Of course, you said she looked on it as her favorite, but do you think that it pivoted her into these other types of roles eventually? Or do you think they just stuck her back in the romantic comedies? As A little bit of both. She still did some of these romantic comedies afterward. I can't remember when Becky Sharp was. I don't know if that's before or after. I think it was after. A little after, 35. Yeah. She was able to fight for pictures and get some of the ones that she wanted. So it gave her some clout. She got good reviews for it. I was always surprised she never got an Academy Award nomination for it, just because she just is so good in it. It was probably because of the the storyline that probably kept people from that. Her career didn't really change much with it. She got a few good parts after that. She was more into theater anyway, so it wasn't a big deal to her. So many of the really talented actresses that just didn't play the game seem to be all about the stage. It definitely yeah. reminds me of, as I mentioned before, Louise Reiner and Katherine Hepburn. Now that you mention that, it's really interesting bringing up the Academy Awards because I bring up 1933. I don't think that Story of Temple Drake was nominated for anything. But it seems that that year, for Best Actress, of course, that was the year Katherine Hepburn won for Morning Glory. But there were only two other nominees, Mae Robson for Lady for a Day and Diana Winward for Cavalcade, which we don't really talk about. This I feel like if we had filled out the five, this would be a fantastic nomination to put in. I'm, as you mentioned, I'm just as upset as you are that Miriam isn't in this five because they didn't even have five. <laughs> they should have just yeah. put her in. Yeah. But I think they were trying to, the Hayes Code was in effect then. Actually, Temple Drake was one of the ones, films that they finally said, okay, they were too lax about the code up until then, and they became more stricter after that. So Temple Drake was one of the films that they finally said, okay, this is enough. Can't have this garbage on the screen anymore. And they made it even more strict for the films because... The Hayes office was very involved in the making of Temple Drake. They had representatives come and see the rushes every day. They would make suggestions. The first time they had a three-page letter on changes they wanted to make to the script, which Paramount did some, but they did on others. Like, for one, in the rape scene, whenever Temple's laying in the barn on the floor, they didn't want any corn cobs anywhere in the scene. But when you watch the film, it's filled with corn cobs. So there were some things they just didn't listen to. And other ones they felt if it didn't hurt the movie, they placated them and made the changes. I was comparing it while I was watching it mentally to other films that I know or that are notoriously pre-code. I was thinking, there's no nudity. She's not really vampy. She's not 
actively seducing anybody. Cops don't even really show up in this. We just go straight to court. Nobody's getting arrested. We don't quite have the depiction of the police as the do-gooders. And I was actually trying to realize what, aside from the fact that she is making out with several boys in different cars and drinking moonshine, which is illegal at the time that they're making this, I was thinking, what exactly is really free code about it? Because at the end, she does do good, but I guess she doesn't get married like in a Shakespeare play. So I guess that scene is immoral. But she does have a man claim her at the end. And you can only mm-hmm. extrapolate that she will finally settle down. And if he'll have her after this escapade, probably get married. So it was such an interesting limbo picture from my understanding of what pre-code cinema was like and post-code cinema was like. She was such a literary person. And I didn't know much about her until I was looped into this episode and realized we were doing this. But her first break was in a play that was based on a Theodore Dreiser book. He was censored quite a lot. She was dealing with the very real politics of the day of what is art, what should be censored, what is suitable for the American public, which I'm not sure if you're not a huge classic movie fan, which you're not fully steeped into the world of it. I'm not sure if you can fully grasp just how obsessed America was at the time of putting good morality, air quotes, on display. And she would have been in the thick of that discussion right as the code was taking over her livelihood. And I'm just curious, was she outspoken about it? I know she was watched by the FBI. She was a very political person. And I'm wondering just how she negotiated that with her love of literature and art. Whenever Temple Drake came out, there was a big discussion about the code. She called them the censors. She said Paramount had to deal with the censors and they did the best job that they could with it. She felt that they should just let the the producers do what they want and let the people decide what they want to see and that people shouldn't be going around censoring what everybody could watch because not everybody had the same taste in everything. She was very liberal and she became very political, especially after she married Anatole Litvak, because he got her involved in politics after that. But before that, she wasn't so much involved in it, but she was still very liberal in her social views. Then after her marriage to him, then she got more involved in the politics of the Screen Actors Guild and even with certain politicians. As we were touching on before, you could make the argument that the code hindered Miriam from getting an Oscar. So many of the films that she made throughout the 30s and even some in the 40s, like the lady with the red hair that I've seen in love with with her and Claude Rains. I believe that she probably had to fight the code on nearly every movie that she made throughout her prime. They were able to include some of the scenes that They unfortunately had to cut from some of these films. She would have been able to display her talent a lot better. And not that she wasn't able to. For people who are listening that aren't necessarily a Miriam Hopkins fan, we could just go back and forth on so many amazing, amazing Miriam Hopkins movies because there are so many that I love. I know she was Star of the Month. It was in January. I want to say last January, I watched every single movie that I could. During that entire month, we talk about these three, talk about the code. That is such a powerful one that I'm sure they really had to fight tooth and nail to get some of these scenes, but they didn't get as much as they wanted from that movie either. There are just so many good examples. For these three, they had to change the whole theme of the movie to make it so palatable for general audiences, because back then you couldn't even mention a lesbian back then. But I think they did a good job in adjusting it because a lot of times people have said that the code made producers be more creative and more particular in their scripts. I think in some way that is true, just like these three. They made it a romantic triangle and it worked just as well that way as it would have been whenever the children's hour was made, which they more followed it. But even Shirley MacLaine complained about that and said that They could have done more with the gay point of view. She thought it was handled just a little bit too much, but at least the theme was there and you knew what it was by the end of the movies. That and Becky Sharp and this all stick out to me as films of hers that if they had just kept everything that they could have made, if they 
had been able to put anything that they had wanted to, she would have gotten that nomination. And if people had been a little more tolerant of mm-hmm. <laughs> the things that she was doing on screen. Definitely the code kept her from getting that Oscar nomination that year. I've seen the other performances and they were good, of course, but I don't know. It was just something about Miriam's. What's so fascinating is that I had to go and read the synopsis of the Faulkner novel that this is based on. You can tell that Code dipped its little fingers into this because the novel, Temple lies on the stand. She's not a good person. She basically sends an innocent man to the gallows and he's actually murdered by a squad that it's extra judicial in the novel. Yeah, and Faulkner, really dark, really doesn't hide from anything. And yet the end of Temple Drake, she does what she's supposed to do. She does what her goody two-shoes boyfriend asks and pleads for her to do. That's a very stark opposite contrast to what the source novel says Temple is going to do. And it's actually gutting that she didn't get a chance to really swing for the fences and play a corrupted, air quotes, woman in this movie. That's the code. The end of the film, you have to pay for your crimes. They couldn't allow her to do that. Otherwise, it would be against the code. You see that in all the codes. At the end, the person either dies for their sins or somehow how they, they have to pay for the sin at the end. I do like the ending as it is, just because yeah. I can't imagine her. I want to find something redeeming in Miriam Hopkins always. <laughs> so I think the fact that she does the right thing in the end makes me happy for her. And the fact that she's able to be so strong and to publicly come out and say that after mm-hmm. everything that's happened to her. That makes her character very brave. And I don't know if the original ending would have had the same effect on me, but what do you guys think? Would you have preferred the original? I agree with you that the ending they chose, it redeemed her. I don't think you could feel sorry for her with the original ending. And I know that that's the way some movies end after the code was gone. They were just as good. But just me personally, the one that they did for the film was a little more satisfying anyway. What are you guys' final thoughts? What do you think of this movie? Would you recommend this to people? And a lot of the people who are probably listening haven't seen this movie. This is our chance to sell it. I'm being introduced to a world of cinema that I just never experienced as someone who I wasn't raised to be in a classic film kind of household. It was like, whatever's playing on HBO and it's probably something new. I am loving being introduced to all of these really inspiring people that I didn't know anything about. And Miriam Hopkins, just reading your book, is just a truly fascinating woman, almost out of her time. And to see her in this particular film where she is playing with political things that we barely even show on screen now, 90 years later, was a really revelatory experience for me. And I can't thank you enough for putting this on the schedule because it's a really phenomenal movie. I had to. We had to get Alan on for sure to talk about Miriam because I'm just such a big fan. I had to choose this movie because I want to put it in front of as many eyeballs as possible. This is just one of those movies that is so ahead of its time and revolutionary is honestly a word that I would use to describe the story of Temple Drake. I would recommend it to anybody. Alan, let's roll it out with you. Let's end it with your thoughts on this movie and your thoughts on Miriam. If you can condense your love into those words. First of all, the film, yeah, I would definitely recommend it. After it did its run in 1933, it was never re-shown again. They never re-released it. That's how it got lost over time. It's interesting that in 1972, Miriam was invited to MoMA in New York. They were showing the story of Temple Drake as part of a film festival for Paramount's 60th anniversary. And it was the first movie they were going to show. So Miriam was invited and she went there. It's interesting differences in audiences in different time periods. This audience in 1972, when they showed the movie, they actually laughed during parts of it, which really upset Miriam. And she felt that the film didn't hold up well because of it. I don't see how any audience could laugh at it. That's the way I guess the the thoughts were of of audiences in the 70s, maybe. I don't know. They didn't think that it was a serious movie. 
I've dealt with some inappropriate laughter for films, but that is a whole other level. The worst that I've ever heard was uh, this year's TCM festival. I went to see Butterfield 8 and some people laughed during some pretty uh, crazy scenes in that movie. And it almost reminds me of this similar kind of tones and things that they're laughing about. Wow, that's crazy. I can't believe, honestly. In any case, hopefully modern audiences will be a little kinder and watch this movie with some serious eyes and some fresh eyes because I think it really deserves it. This is one of those movies I'm so glad Criterion restored and released it because Mm. it deserves that level of attention. Well, thank you so much, Alan, for joining us. Here is your chance to plug anything you want to plug, your site where we can find your wonderful book, all of that good stuff. You can get it on Amazon, University of Kentucky Press. You can get it there. That They're the publishers. Currently, a couple of years ago, I had a book published on Anita Page. She was a silent film star. Another wonderful actress. Love her. And right now I'm working on a history of Hollywood Forever Cemetery and That's the people wonderful. that are buried, which should be done within a few months. That is so cool. Hollywood Forever is one of my favorites. Everyone should definitely check that book out when it comes out. That closes out Ticklish Business for today. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get podcasts. Reviews matter, so leave us a review. Five stars should do. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Ticklish underscore biz, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Ticklish Biz. You can follow me at Classic Film Geek on Twitter, and you can find my blog at musingsofaclassicfilmedic.com. Emily, where can fans find and get in touch with you? I am across all social medias at the handle Ms. Emily Edwards. That's MS Emily Edwards, spelled in a very traditional and boring way. Please reach out and get in touch because I love meeting all of the new classic film fans. I'm learning so much and I'm so excited to be here. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do all of our new content. So consider helping us out at patreon.com slash ticklish biz. And don't forget, Kristen's book, But Have You Read the Book, is out wherever you find books. So be sure to pick that up. We will have another episode in two weeks. 